All right, hello, hello, welcome. Uh, my name's Shaughnessy Miller. I'm on the Kidlit uh, programming at the Bronx Book Festival. Thank you so much for coming. We're very excited to see everyone. Um, we're going to start the Stories to Die For Young Adult panel, and it will be moderated by Chelsea Arnold from the Bronx Library Center. Um, I want to introduce Chelsea. So, oh. I'll let Chelsea introduce herself, actually. I don't have her introduction, but we're so excited to have you all here with this wonderful panel. Chelsea, come on up. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chelsea Arnold. I'm the supervising librarian at the Bronx Library Center. Thank you for coming today. So today we have Lauren Blackwood with us, Tiffany D. Jackson, Victoria Lee, Vincent Tirado, and Diana Rodriguez Wallace. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna take a So to start today, I wanted to ask you guys if there were any books that you enjoyed with that when you were younger that were sort of thriller or horror based, and if these inspired you when you were writing these books at all. Um, I guess I can go first. <laughs> so I was actually um, asking some of these other panelists earlier what the name of the book was that I was trying to remember that I'd been obsessed with when I was younger. Um, I remember going to the library and like, I knew like where the author's books were, and every time I went to the library, I would look and see if he had a new one, and he usually did, until one day he didn't, and it was because he had died, which was tragic. But um, it was John Belair's The House with the Clock in, his wall in Its Walls, and he had like a whole series just about like this kid getting adopted by his uncle and then like solving ghost mysteries. And yeah, I think that one is like a solid influence for me. Uh, so I grew up mostly reading hard novels, so I went literally from Arl Stein to Stephen King and nothing in between. Um, and one of the first uh, Stephen King books I read was actually Carrie. Uh, and I think I was like maybe like 12. Uh, and so things were, it was a bit more advanced for me at the time, but it was an amazing story and it definitely uh, inspired a lot of my writing uh, moving forward. Um, so I was a classics kid when I was growing up, so um, I loved H.G. Wells, so like The Invisible Man and The War of the Worlds, um, and then of course Jane Eyre, which my book is based off of. So yeah, the classics, Dracula, all those good things. So I was a child of the 90s. I was a huge fan of Christopher Pike and R.L. Stein and I actually got to meet R.L. Stein a couple of years ago when one of my books, uh, Proof of Lies, came out, and I got to go to the Thriller Awards, and it was like a year when George R.R. R. Martin of Game of Thrones was like the Grand Master, and so everybody at the conference was like going bananas to meet him, and I'm like the only person with like a 20-year-old copy of like Fear Street, and like <laughs> so dying to meet R.L. Stein. And he made this joke on a panel that he was on when everyone was kind of complaining about social media and how like tough it is to be an author on Twitter and how mean people can be. And R.L. Stein's, he's like in his 70s now. He's like, I don't know what you guys are talking about. He's like, I'm beloved. He's like, my <laughs> 90s fans love me. And like, I like chased him down after the pad out and like, please sign my Fear Street. I'm one of your 90s fans. <laughs> so it was great. No. <laughs> I did not really read horror as a kid. I, I got into horror like a few years ago. So I cannot relate to anyone liking horror as a kid. Okay, great, thank you. So I wanted to ask, when you set out to write these stories specifically, what made you interested in writing them for teen audiences as opposed to adult audiences? So for me, that's a tough question because I wasn't really sure as I was writing it who it would end up being for. Um, I think I was, I was very much writing it for like the kind of like 
17 to 20 kind of demographic, like almost like this new adult age range. Um, and But in editing, it ended up becoming much more like for teens in general. And I think part of why I ended up going that direction was because um, I think specifically characters like Ellis in this, like Ellis is so extra. Like she's constantly just like smoking cigarettes and like drinking bourbon and like pretending she likes it and wearing these like you know elbow patch outfits and like you could almost think that that's normal in like a grad student or like a college student like I don't know maybe they're just like a little pretentious or something but in a high school you're like no something's up like this is almost like a red flag like <laughs> why are you doing all of this stuff and so I think that um Ellis more than anything made me end up going in the YA direction because I wanted to highlight how freaking weird she was um, and it was a lot easier to do that when she was, like, a 17-year-old as opposed to, like, a 20-year-old. Um, I think I realized, uh, and it, this realization really happened, like, a couple of years ago, that uh, when I was younger, you know, of course, like, reading all this, you know, horror novels and stuff like that, I actually never saw myself in the novels. Um, and I didn't realize that until much old when I was older, and I actually started to get into this career that I'm in right now. And it finally hit me that like, I'm actually writing novels for my younger self, for younger Tiffany who wanted to see herself on the page, who wanted to see herself like be like the hero or like the victim in some way or some capacity. So I think that has been sort of my mission now is because we don't have a lot of black girls in horror novels at all. We barely have you know, a lot of people writing in this genre. And even when I started, you know, there was a hesitation about like, you know, will horror sell? Will black people buy horror? Um, and so obviously a lot of things have changed over the years. Uh, we definitely have like Jordan Peele-isms that have come out and now everyone's super supporting him, which of course domino effects and supports, you know, writers of color as well too, but um, yeah, I think that's basically what I decided is that, you know, like I know that there are another, there's thousands of young Tiffany's out there who want to get scared, <laughs> who want to sit in their house, in their bed, under the covers, r reading a scary novel or whatever. Um, and so I know there's more of me out there. I know that I'm not alone. And so therefore I wanted to write for those young girls. Yeah. Uh, same Tiffany, same. Um, Growing up, there weren't a lot of novels with the black girl being the lead, especially the romantic lead, um, saving the day, especially um, the type of novels I love, the classic novels, the gothic novels, there was never black girls in there. So I definitely wanted to showcase black girls like me in that sort of setting and getting the guy at the end, spoiler. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it was definitely about the books I read as a kid and not seeing what needed to be there. And I'm like, hey, I could write this. So I did. Yeah. For me, um, Small Town Monsters is actually my eighth young adult novel. So my, I think my voice just naturally comes out YA. When I wrote my debut, it was like way back in 2008, uh, A More in Summer Secrets, and I hadn't told anyone I was going to write a book. Like, I was not that kid who always dreamed of being an author. I was a reporter. I was living in Manhattan. I was covering hotels and real estate. And I just had this idea I was going to write a book one day. And I didn't tell my parents until after I got an agent that I had written a book. Like, and when I told them, I think like their first reaction was, oh, yeah, that's great. You know, like as if like you had told your parents, like I'm gonna be on Broadway or something. <laughs> and then when I told them, no, 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 it's a young adult novel, they said, oh, I get that. Yeah, I totally see that now. And so all of my friends had the same re reaction to that. They're like, oh, I could totally see you writing YA novels. That makes sense. Um, so this is, this book, uh, Burn Down, Rise Up, is like set in the Bronx, um, and a lot of the places that are like mentioned are are like actual real places in the Bronx. So Hyde High School um, is literally the high school that I went to. Uh, the Point CDC was a community de development center that I spent a lot of my time at as a kid. So it wasn't really like 
a massive decision to decide like okay this is gonna be YA it was kind of mirrored after um, like my experiences living in the Bronx as a teen Great. Um, so we talked a little bit about diversity and race and sexuality are topics that come up in a lot of your books. So I want to ask you how important you find it is to include diversity in your books. And given, unfortunately, the widespread book bans that we've been seeing recently, do you fear including any of these topics when you go about writing? Um, so I can't seem to write a straight book to save my life. Um, <laughs> So that's, I think that's part of why I keep writing queer books is I just, it's not that like straight people aren't interesting. I think it's just that like I, I'm way more interested in the romances between queer people. Um, and maybe that's just because of like my experience and me being queer. Maybe it's because I feel like there aren't as many of them. And so like they're more interesting necessarily because they are, are fewer. Uh, but it is important to me, especially writing YA, to have queer characters kind of front and center and queer characters be featured in the romances, whether those are like healthy romances that end with a happy ending or whether they're super toxic ones like in A Lesson in Vengeance. Um, and in terms of the book bans, I mean, this book has been banned because it features a lesbian main couple in like several, it's on several different lists. Uh, and I do think to a certain degree, yeah, it does scare me. Maybe because with my very first book, The Fever King, that was my debut. Um, like when it first came out, the Amazon page was just inundated with all of these homophobic reviews, just like making all of these weird assumptions about like my life or like implications about what I must be like or what like my relationships must be like. And that was extremely hard. And I think sometimes when I am thinking about a book I want to write, it does go through my head, like, can I do that again? Can I go through that again? Can I put another one of these books out here and deal with not just the homophobia from, like, overt homophobes, but, like, you know, questions about, like, oh, like, is it okay to write a queer relationship that's unhealthy? Is it okay to write a queer relationship that doesn't end well? Um, and so I think that does always go through my mind. But again, like I said, I can't write a straight book to save my life, so... Even if I'm nervous about it, I just keep doing the same thing and can't seem to stop. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I'm writing about diversity because I'm writing about myself. Um, I, I guess, that there's, I mean, I feel like white is not the default or should not be the default. So always when, we, when this question comes up, I'm kind of like, well, I mean, there should be black people in books, period. Like. Um, but I guess as far as like book banning is concerned, because, you know, hi, <laughs> I've been banned all over the place lately and I'm a part of a whole bunch of people like very much targeted and I know my next book. So my next book is, uh, called The Weight of Blood and it is a story that's set at a school's first integrated prom with a girl who had been passing for white uh, for her entire uh, life. And now she's been exposed. And so it's basically uh, a homage to Stephen King's Carrie, which I mentioned earlier. That was one of the first books that I ever read. Um, and this is the actual, and this is now my sixth book, um, eighth in total. Um, over the last five years, and um, this is the first book that I'm actually talking about racism. Even though I'm on all these critical race theory ban books, lists, and all that kind of stuff, but this is the first one that I'm like, hi, oh my god. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, uh, so this is like the first book that I'm actually talking about racism. So I'm, re I'm like, I'm actually like, hardcore ready to have those conversations now. Before, I was just truly confused. Like, why Why am I in this? Like, why am I in this conversation? Like, why? now how am I get in this? But um, I guess, yeah, I guess I'm ready to have those conversations because I think it's important. I think it's important that we also like be authors that stand up to the nonsense. And quite frankly, that uh, like, I'm ready for that type of game. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah, so um, this is my first novel um, starring a black girl, but I definitely 
don't plan on writing any main character who isn't black. Um, so, and my next book, the entire cast of characters are black. And this one, all the main characters are black. Uh, but it takes place in Ethiopia, which was never colonized. So like race really doesn't come into the story. Um, so have not been banned yet, but you know, give me time, <laughs> give me time. <laughs> I gotcha. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> uh, for me, my first books that I wrote, the, they were contemporary romances featuring a girl who's half Polish and half Puerto Rican and goes to spend the summer in Utuado, Puerto Rico, which is where my dad is from. So it's like straight up like very autobiographical, very own voices before that was a thing. And I didn't realize when I wrote that that it would set an expectation that all of my books would be in a similar vein. So to me, I thought like, okay, I wrote like my big fat Puerto Rican book for my dad. Now I'm gonna set a book in Poland, which is where you know my mom is from. So when I wrote my next series and it was like spy thrillers, proof of lies, I was getting all these responses from editors who were like, oh, I'm, I'm surprised the main character isn't Latina. And at first, like back then this was I was sort of feeling like I was being told what to write or I was being pigeonholed. And then I came to the realization after those books came out and they were so embraced by the Latinx community and were pumped and you know, promoted and boosted and everything. And I realized that what they were trying to tell me is that there are not enough books featuring Latinx characters written by Latinx creators. And can you please continue to write that? You need, instead of seeing yourself in a box, like I felt like I needed to make that box a whole lot bigger. So when I wrote Small Town Monsters, I wanted to write a horror novel. And I'm like, how many horror novels do you know where the main character and her family are Puerto Rican? And that is not the point of the story. It's not this cultural story. It's not this identity story. It's not a problem story. It's just a horror novel. And the main character and her family at the center of it happen to be Puerto Rican. And so I wanted to give that experience to all those kids out there who may love horror and just want to see themselves in a horror novel where it isn't a problem novel. Word. Um. Because this book is set in the Bronx, it would feel really weird if there were no black characters. I mean, <laughs> like, that would, it wouldn't be the Bronx, first of all. Um, so I guess like it has to be diverse because that's literally just kind of the truth of what the Bronx is. And like, I mean, I haven't been banned yet, but even if I had like straight washed my book, I probably would still end up on a banned book list for like promoting critical race theory or whatever the hell. And it's just like, okay, but you can't come to the Bronx and be like, oh, this whole place uh, promotes critical race theory because everyone is black. And I was just like, that's literally just how it is. Great, thank you for those. Um, so we talked a little bit about how some of you uh, do a little bit autobiography in your books. So I wanted to know how you go about creating the characters and if you're inspired by any people in your lives that you know. Um, so I'm definitely not inspired pretty much ever by people in my real life. Um, I feel like people in my real life are constantly asking me if any of the characters were inspired by people in my real life. <laughs> the answer is no. Um, I mean, there are autobiographical portions, for example, to all of my books. Like for this one, I wrote it during my dissertation year of doing a PhD and like I was miserable and like depressed and anxious. And, you know, I remember telling my PhD advisor that I was having a really hard time and his response was, oh, well, do you need to like leave? It wasn't like, you know, oh, how can I create a less hostile lab environment? Or is there anything in like the culture of the university that's making this more difficult for you? It was like, oh, should you be here then? And um, so a lot of what I was thinking about when I wrote this book, it's not like a character was inspired by my PhD advisor or a character was inspired by me. It's more that like that entire situation just fed into the story and into thinking about like how in academia, like we expect people to be extremely passionate about this tiny niche subject that like you and four other people in the entire world care about. But then also like if you end up getting stressed or anxious or end up becoming depressed, it's like, well, that's your own fault, that's your own problem, like, you should have kept it together, um, even though we, like, expect you to work 100-hour weeks and explicitly tell you that if you're working a 60-hour week, that's not enough, but 
it's it's always kind of like put back on the individual and becomes the individual's own fault. So I would say that that's like the autobiographical component of this book. Um, I'm sorry to all of my friends and enemies who might like to be written into future books. I don't <laughs> think it's going to happen. <laughs> um, so most of my books, uh, all except one, were loosely inspired by a real case. Um, even uh, White Smoke was loosely inspired by two things. Uh, one, uh, burning houses in Detroit, and the second was a haunting that actually happened in Japan. That was like my first like international like case that I like covered. Um, so generally speaking, yes, I guess I'm. It's not autobiographical. I I can talk some days. Um, <laughs> um, it's not really autobiographical, but I do like kind of like I definitely pillage from people's lives because um, everyone is a source of inspiration. Um, and I think that's incredibly important, right? Uh, that's one of the reasons why they always say, like, you know, write what you know. Um, and the best way to write what you know is to actually explore and experience the world. So I definitely try to have conversations I, with strangers. I talk about lives. Um, the only book that actually had maybe more of an autobiographical was um, my book, Grown which uh, talked a lot about um, age and appropriate relationships, which I was in one in high school. So uh, was that, the book wasn't based on my life, um, but it definitely was based on my emotions that I was going through when I was in a like sexual assault relationship. So that was the only book that I actually felt like you saw more of me in, in terms of like the emotional part, but yeah. And I always say like, one of the best things about writing for kids nowadays, and I, you know, I feel like I just had this conversation with kids at like a school visit is, even though we're, we're like, you know, we're old people writing, you know, the lives of children. One thing that never changes is emotions and feelings. Like, the same way you fall in love in 1970 or 80 or whatever, not trying to date myself here, but uh, is the same way that kids fall in love today. Uh, those emotions never change. So I always tell kids, like, yeah, like, I may not know your lived experiences right now. I definitely don't know what it's like to grow up in a social media age, etc. But I definitely know what, what it feels like when you have that first kiss or when you experience your first haunting uh, the first time you get into a fight with your mom and you like, you know, you actually stand up for yourself and you don't get like popped. Like I, I like I know all those feelings. And so I think that's important for us to sort of like really articulate to kids is that we we actually know feelings why where you're coming from. We may not know your lived experiences completely, but we definitely we hear you. We see you. and We're trying to recreate that as best as we can. So, you know, I think that's important for us to say that we're also adults up here and we also make mistakes. We may, may not get it exactly right, but it's important for us to also like be conscious of the fact that no, we, we still, we feel you though. Yeah, so nobody in within these wicked walls is based off of any sort of person or anything. Um, but yeah, emotions are real, like things that I've been wanting to express are real and like, um, I definitely like go for anime levels of drama. So like none of the <laughs> none of the people are like based off real people because I'm like it, this has to be like a telenovela or bust, you know? <laughs> like so, uh, but yeah, the emotions and the feelings, like expressing like um, there's um, instances of expressing depression, which are very real, and longing, which is very real, and um, having to do things on your own and like go out in the world when you're you're not quite ready but you have really have no choice but to do that um, so like themes and emotions but not so much people so as I mentioned my first book was straight up autobiographical so I mean I changed it, it's fictionalized I didn't grow up wealthy or anything like that but the experiences she has in Utuado, Puerto Rico are pretty much my relatives that I met when I went there. But since then, like the funny thing I like to do in all of my books, I drop in Easter eggs. If you know me in real life, you know when you read my books, like what I pulled from real life. 
So like in one of my books, I listed the main character. She talks about her sister and all of her ex-boyfriends. And she lists these five ex-boyfriends, like Jordan, Ted, Matt, Jeremy, and Gideon. And it's my husband and his brothers. So, you know, like when you get to those <laughs> passages, they're always kind of funny. Um, in Small Town Monsters, I used a lot. So I've used so many of my friends' names that now on like book eight, I'm using their kids' names. Okay, so I know if my friends and family have read my book because if they didn't take a picture of the page that has their kid's name on it, I'm like, you didn't read it yet. I'm like, you definitely didn't read it yet. So I always do those little things in there. There's tons of little Easter eggs. I remember in one of my books, I made reference to an uncle who served in Vietnam and he was the radio operator for a search and destroy platoon. And my dad calls me up and he's like, I can't believe you remember that's what Uncle Marcelo did. And I was like, I paid attention. I was like, those little <laughs> anecdotes make it in there. I mean, there's a book uh, where it takes place at Cornell that I wrote where my husband went to school and all the fraternity stuff in there, I would just look up while I'm typing and be like, Jordan, give me something stupid that somebody did. And he's like, this kid threw a desk out the window. And I'm like, doop, it's in there. <laughs> so little anecdotes, but not like a whole character. Um, I guess my book is semi-autobiographical because it is like, you know, based off my own experiences uh, in the Bronx. Uh, the main character is like loosely based off like my personality uh, when I was in high school. Like she, like very like sarcastic, kind of a smart ass, school comes easy to her, which was just like my experience. And then like one of the other characters, Aaron, is like very loosely based off of like my little brother who just like has so much unearned confidence that I'm just like, it's, it's so funny to me. And so I was just like, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna make them best friends in this situation. <laughs> And that's what I did. And he doesn't know this at all, because I think if he read it, he'd be like, oh, this guy's such a loser. And I'm like, yeah, that guy's you, though. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Um, so as part of uh, writing horror, obviously the settings are really important. So how do you choose where to set your stories, and how do you think it contributes to the atmosphere of your book? So um, my first two books weren't horror, but they were just set in like a fictional dystopian version of my hometown of Durham, North Carolina. Uh, so that was pretty easy. I just wanted to write a book that was set in Durham. Uh, this one, uh, so it's set in the Catskills. And my best friend and I, about like once a year, we like to go and rent an Airbnb in the Catskills and just work on whatever books that we're currently working on. And there's something like, there's something creepy about the Catskills. I mean, I'm sorry to anybody who like lives there, but personally, when I go there, I feel like at least 10% of these houses are haunted. And so when I wanted to write, like, this is set in a boarding school that's in the Catskills. And to me, that just seemed like the perfect location, um, both because I could go up there like, and do like area research whenever I was with my friend, but also because um, like you, you are near you know, you're near New York City, you're near Albany, you're near all of these, like, larger places, and, you know, there are other towns, too, like, New Paltz and, like, Socrates, but if you go just, like, 10 minutes outside of those, sometimes it can feel like you are on a completely different planet or just completely isolated from the rest of the world, and so I thought that worked really well for this book, where everything that's happening at the school, even aside from, like, the ghost stuff and the witchcraft stuff, like, just the characters seem like they have no connection to reality in a lot of ways. Like they're yeah. just completely on a different level, just like up there in their own heads. And so I liked putting it in a location like the Catskills where you could truly feel separate from reality while nevertheless being so close to like big cities and to like towns where there are people just living their normal lives, not dealing with ghosts and witches. Uh, so for my two horrors, White Smoke and For Way to Blood, I actually made up both towns. Um, and they're loosely inspired. Like uh, for White Smoke, it's loosely inspired by Detroit. Uh, but it was the first time I actually like sat down and made up like actually like world build. So I have a lot of respect now for fantasy authors because I'm like, oh, this is this is hard. <laughs> but um, it was actually fun to sort of like make up and like I would like sit down and like put like a map together like make my own map which was completely like incorrect like in the real world thing but uh that was like fun to do and you know just sort of like 
learning about small town life, because I'm, I'm from Brooklyn. I, I journeyed here to the Bronx. <laughs> Um, my once a year pilgrimage, but, uh, like we're used to, you know, crowds, we're used to all this kind of stuff and I wasn't used to like small town life. So I actually had to, you know, research and talk to people like, Hey, what does it feel like to live in like a foot football town? Like, what do you guys do on those Friday nights? Like with that show? I literally watched Friday night lights. I've never watched it before. That was like a part of my research. Um, so it was really interesting to sort of like research that kind of life. Like, what is it like to like live on a farm? Like, I, I didn't know a lot of this stuff. So uh, it definitely took a lot of research. Um, but I think setting is really important, especially like having a horror uh, live in a setting in a, like we did haunted houses and stuff like that. And, and knowing what your house is supposed to feel like, what's supposed to smell like, how you said like 10% of homes in Catskills are definitely haunted. There's definitely something up there. <laughs> like, I, I mean, please visit, but <laughs> there's definitely something up with the Catskills. But yeah, I think definitely in terms of like having that feeling that you know in the pit of your summit that something is wrong, I think it's all about like the emotions in terms of like making sure all the senses are hit. So like taste, smell, what you hear, um, the creaking of like floorboards and stuff like that. Like that's super important in order for like to make maintain a setting um, in terms of at least for haunted houses. Did I, did I just take your answer? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> A little bit, but I got, <laughs> I got a, a couple other things I can say. Um, so, yeah, Within These Wicked Walls is set in a haunted castle, but it's like in the deserts of Ethiopia. So um, that's kind of a change from the normal setting. Um, but I really think that you can sort of make any setting scary if you add an aspect of something is misunderstood or hidden. That's the scary part that you can add to any setting. Um, so I did a haunted house with creepy things happening inside, but outside it's like pretty normal, but there's still a sense of like dread in yeah. it, even though you're like, oh, she lives here and it's the desert and, um, but she's used to it, but, but is she, there's something <laughs> going on. Um, so yeah, setting does play a huge part. It's almost like a, its own character. Yeah. Like yeah, you got to get the setting right, but I think that you give, like, you know those um, mysterious, uh, dark, tall, dark, and handsome guys, and you're like, oh, he's so mysterious, he's so dangerous. He's dangerous because he's mysterious, because you don't know too much about him, and that's, like, attractive. And you can do the same thing with a setting, and yeah. make your setting seductive, I don't know. Not so that was a good, that, no, that like, was a good yeah. analogy, yes, that's exactly it. So like, it's creepy and it's like, oh, dangerous. It's like, oh snap, do I want to be over here? But it's because you don't know what's going on yet. And then you find out what's going on and you really don't want to be there. So yeah, the setting is like a character in that way. Oh, I totally agree. I think setting is so important, especially for horror. Um, any of my books, like my, my first seven books were all set in real places and I traveled to every single place. So even the books that took place in Europe and South America, if that is a coffee shop I described in Rome, that place exists and that is the wallpaper on the walls. Awesome. So it was like very specific. I had a book that took place, um, the ending was in Rio de Janeiro. It's exactly based on my friend's wedding who got married there. And I was like, you have to read this. I even include your wedding flowers. <laughs> I'm like, it's all in there. Um, but for Small Town Monsters, it's my first book where I made up the setting, mostly because the book is, it's kind of like the conjuring and uh, imagining what it would be like if this girl's parents were demonologists and evil is spreading through town and there's this cult. And I thought it would be sort of mean to make that a real town, like that everyone there is demonic and they're all in this <laughs> cult together. So I set it in Roaring Creek, Connecticut, which is loosely based on Mystic, Connecticut. It's supposed to be this foggy, coastal New England town. 
Uh, but it was the first time where I had to make it up and like imagine what Main Street would be like and imagine how long it would take to walk somewhere. And so I agree with the world building that in order to do that, you've got to focus so much on the smells and the senses and whatever to make it really feel like Roaring Creek is a place you may have actually been, except hopefully there's not, you know, a demon and a cult going through it. <laughs> um, so off the Bronx? I, I mean, I don't know how to uh, answer this question. Uh, it's like, because this book is like very much based on uh, history, I don't think I could have set it anywhere else without changing the entire story. Um, so yeah, that like it was, the setting was also like, I guess technically its own character in a sense, um, which made it very integral to the plot, to the characters, to the development of the, the story being told. Hey, thank you so much. Do you have any advice you would give to young people who are aspiring to become writers? Uh, I think my biggest advice is to write the story that you're obsessed with. So um, I've definitely had books that I've tried to write and they never get finished where I'm not completely obsessed with them, like by which I'm talking about like hyper fixated, like thinking about it before I go to bed at night, wake up in the morning and the first thing I gotta do is like, you know, write down this thought that I had while I was trying to fall asleep. Um, and I, cause I feel like the reader can tell when the author is not obsessed. And like, yeah. how can you expect a reader to be obsessed with your characters or obsessed with your book if they can tell that you don't really care? And so if you have all these ideas and you're trying to think about which one to write, like, it's so easy to get caught up in thinking about, oh, what's marketable or what do I think should sell or what do I think that people want to read? Like, Think about what you're passionate about and what you're obsessed with and write the book that you can't stop thinking about because that's going to be the book that hopefully your readers won't be able to stop thinking about. And like you'll be able, if, if you want to read that book so badly, there's at least one to 500,000 other people who want to read that exact same book. Can I jump um, off of that? Sorry. Please write the book you're obsessed with because... If you hated writing it, you're gonna hate revising it. And you yes. have to revise your book. So I loved writing this book. I hated revising it like the fifth time I had to revise it. Just write what you like, because it will make revising so much easier. God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say to young writers is to read as much as possible. And I know that sounds really cheesy. It sounds like the teacher answer, but that's exactly how I learned how to write. Um, I didn't go to school for writing. I went to school for film production, uh, which is technically sort of like creativity in terms of, you know, different media. Um, but that how I learned to write was studying other writers and studying other, like reading mentor text. Um, so I feel like that's like the best way to write. And I would also say like, if you want to be an author, man, start now. Like, I wish I had all the like, things that you guys have now to like come out with like books and stuff like that. So like my first ever book that I wrote was freshman year of high school. Y'all will never see that book. But <laughs> <laughs> um, but if I had like Wattpad, if I had like Amazon Indie, if I could have self-published back then, man, you would have seen like at least 20, like 50 books from me by, by now. Uh, and the fact that there's so many young authors who started writing and like got publishing deals at like 16 now, like right now, like I wish I had those opportunities. So I would say definitely if you have a story that you really wanna write, I would start now, um, don't wait. Uh, I know like sometimes there's patience, but honestly, and maybe you won't come out with a book right away, uh, but definitely practice makes perfect because every drawer book, books that don't make it into the world, i.e. my freshman year book, um, that's just practice and practice makes perfect. It's literally just the way, like even the way you practice for sports, like writing is very much, you know, a, like it's, what's it called? It's about being resilient and it's about kind of like building that sort of endurance in order to write. So I would say start right now. Um, if you know that this is something that you really, really want to do. And honestly, you may come out with a book at age 18. You could pay for your entire college education. You could buy your mama a house. Like, I'm just saying, like, start now. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I would say if you are wanting to write to become published, I'm going to say this as a black author, and I'm sure it can apply to other people as well, but work on your craft. 
because we have to, as black people, as black authors, be at a certain level in order to get into the gate. And so you wanna work on your craft, which is also reading as well as writing. Write the book you love because you're gonna be working on it a lot. Forever. But <laughs> forever, yes. It feels like forever. But yeah, work on your craft because that's gonna be really important. Um, and then also, uh, I can't remember what else I was gonna say, but, oh, be patient, yes. Um, I've had to work on my patience, like, I know it's a virtue, but I'm working on it. Um, you're gonna be doing a lot of waiting, so uh, while you're waiting, you might as well write. Yes. Definitely. Also, I mean, there's no prerequisite required to write a book. I never took a creative writing course in my entire life. Um, I was good at writing, I enjoyed writing, but I grew up with parents who did not have a lot of money, so they looked at me and said, journalism. You know, like, that's how you get a job as a writer. So that's what I did. I, you know, I became a reporter. And even though I was writing about hotels and real estate, writing every day, no matter what you're writing about, is going to improve your craft. So that was a way for me to make money writing while I, you know, considered working on a novel. And in terms of reading a lot, I would say, yes, read what you like, but don't just, don't just read it to consume it for entertainment. Like, really study it and look what you're going to do. Like, when I was going to write Small Town Monsters, it's my first horror novel, and I decided I'm going to start off by reading all the great master horror novels I could get my hands on. Like, I n had never read Stephen King's It. You know, it's a thousand and some pages. It's an intimidating book to look at. And so I started reading all of the classic horror novels and noting when I got scared on the page and what scared me and, like, highlighting what he did here that made it scary. And if you do that enough in a lot of these great master books, you're going to be able to do that in your own work. So even if it's like a romance novel, highlight the pages that got you, that like you're like really loving it, highlight those pages, study those sentences, figure out what that author did, and then try to instill some of those techniques in your own writing and your work will improve because of it. Oh, okay. Um, make friends, make other writer friends. I think that uh, embedding yourself in a writing community is definitely like something that's very helpful. Um, it kind of like keeps you accountable and it also makes you feel less alone when you've hit a writer's block because if you're like, if you're just by yourself, you're going to be thinking, oh, I'm a hack, I'm a terrible writer. If you have a community of friends or like just a community of writers, you're just like, listen, we've all been there. It's going to be okay. You're going to make it through. I, it just makes the process a lot easier. <laughs> Thank you, and I love all the um, shout outs to reading as a librarian, especially <laughs> important with children and young adults, I think, sometimes to push them a little bit. Um, I also do want to mention we have a booth from the library in the back. If anyone <laughs> wants to go there, we have free books. We're giving away free books for children and teens at all of the libraries this summer. Um, so we have a couple minutes. Does anyone from the audience have any questions for the authors? Oh, yes, in the back. Yeah. Oh, there's a microphone in the middle if you want to go over there. Oh, I heard it. I heard it. When do you know you're finished with the book? Oh, okay, great. Uh, it's a crapshoot. Um, it's kind of a feeling, like, uh, you have, um, critique partners and everything who can help you out with that sort of thing. But uh, honestly, to me, I feel like I'm never like, it's never like perfect exactly how I would want it. Like every step of the way, even after the book came out, I'm like, oh, I could have added this scene. Maybe I can do it as a bonus later. But it's like, yeah, I feel like you feel like you're never done. There's always more to say. Absolutely. I mean, I could make the joke that the if the book is done when the cover is on it. Like that, I do not crack open one of my books once it has a cover on it because I know I see something and I'm going to want to change it. So, in terms of like, when do you know to go out to agents 
um, I would say to look up critique partners. So to find that, like pick your genre. If you're writing horror, there's a Horror Writers Association. If you're writing children's, there's a Society of Children's Books, Writers and Illustrators. A lot of these organizations are very low cost to join, um, less than $100, some of them are free. And they will have local chapters in your area. Some are really, really active. So if you're writing anything young adult to picture book, the Society of Children's Books, Writers and Illustrators has so many very active chapters. And they will put you in touch with other authors who are writing in your genre. There's meetups, there's write-a-thons, and that's how you get connected with those people. Um, and maybe your alma mater, try to find people who are writing, you know, books from your alma mater. But yeah, get it, get a few eyes on it before you go out to agents, you know, and if you are going out to an agent, start really small with your list. So you don't want to shoot your shot and do, send it out to a hundred people and you know, it's not working. So send it out to 10 people and see what the response is and go from there. Yeah, I would say in terms of like deciding when to send a book out to agents, um, before you send it to your critique partner, it should be so done that you don't know what else to change. You're just like, I mean, I know that it's not ready, I know that it's not finished, but I don't know what else needs to be fixed. So then you send it out to your critique partners, you can find people on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, there's like an R Destructive Readers subreddit that I found helpful. Um, and then in terms of when to query agents, it's when neither you nor your critique partners know what to change. It still doesn't have to be perfect because your agent will revise it with you and then after them, like your editor at the publishing house will revise it. Um, but just to the point that you don't know how else to make it better. In terms of when it's ready to be published, whether you're self-publishing or traditionally publishing, um, it's when your critique partner or your editor says it's good enough. Because like, honestly, there's always something that could be better, like the others said. Um, I have unfortunately tried to reread my books after they've been published and it's never a good idea. You're always <laughs> like, oh, this is trash actually. Uh, so don't do that. Uh, so I want to piggyback off of everyone um, because yeah, same thing, definitely find critique partners, um, especially people who actually really want to get published, um, not just like people who are just, you know, kind of writing every now and then. Um, but usually I know my book is done when I literally am sick of it. Like when I am ready to actually like fight a piece of paper because I'm so tired of seeing the same damn story. Like I'm ready to like <laughs> two piece this paper. Um, I know, I know it's done. And yeah, just to piggyback off everyone, I still feel like books should be like revolving projects like every now and then I want to like go in and like continue to edit my first book allegedly came out what uh 2017 that was the 18th draft of that novel um and I still sometimes crack it open and when I'm reading it in public I will skip over lines that I wish I could have <laughs> edited out so I literally like people will be like wait so what is she reading because I'm like I don't like that and I will continue on um, and one of the best things about like as you continue to write and write and write you get better over time so like for instance when I said my first book that was the 18th draft of that story my book that comes out in September is the fourth draft of the story. So I've, I'm, I'm getting better <laughs> over time. So yeah, uh, definitely having that patience with yourself. But yeah, when I'm sick of it, I know, I, I know it's done. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, sorry. Yes. In the back there. I'm sorry, can you the just website? step but the mic, babe? Sorry, I came in as you were um, given the website for the um, publishing or the, um, I think you were saying the critique partners, mm -hmm. where we could go to find that information. Oh, where to find critique partners. So 
every genre you can think of has a writing society. So whether it's, you know, Mystery Writers of America, Horror Writers Association, International Thriller Writers, the Society of Children's Books, Writers and Illustrator, Romance Writers of America, they all have a, an organization and those organizations will have local chapters. So seek out that organization, see how active the local chapter is, and they will, if you join, put you in touch with other critique partners to find people that way. Um, and then social media. I think everyone was mentioning social media. So start following some hashtags and writing. Uh, another one is hashtag writing community, you know, the where people are constantly, these are aspiring authors trying, you know, to get published, trying to break in, start following those and following uh, what, you know, they're doing with their books to make those connections genuinely. Like, you never want to reach out to an author and be like, hey, can you read my book? Like, make a, a connection, a friendship, build a relationship first. I would also say, like, Reddit is a great place. Um, like, just go to, like, the subreddit for your neighborhood, like, our Bronx or, like, our Astoria or whatever it is, and then just, like, make a post and be like, is anyone else, like, a writer? Does anyone want to, like, form a writing group? Yeah. Like, even if, like, nobody replies, like, somebody might be like, oh, this is already a thing. Like, you can come. We meet on Tuesdays at Starbucks or whatever. Um, so, like, on Reddit or just, like, Googling or going to meetup.com and being, like, Bronx writing group. Like, it's free, yeah. you can just show up and you can meet people and find people who are writing the similar genre to you and, you know, trade Even stories. on, like, Facebook, there's a lot of, like, writing communities on Facebook and they, you know, local chapters, et cetera. Um, definitely, I, I strongly recommend, like, networking across uh, because those writers will actually have, like, time to really, like, sit and read. Um, also, your local library, like, um, so, I I'm sorry, Bronx, but I, <laughs> like, the Brooklyn Public Library was, like, my mainstay. Like, I was, that was definitely bay for me. I was really in the Brooklyn Public Library a lot when I was writing my first book, and there's definitely a lot of other authors, like, chilling in the library as well, too. Also, the librarians know other authors who will be able to, or either other writing communities, so they'll be able to point you in the right direction, so definitely visit your local, um, branch. Um, branch, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Just <laughs> and there's a hashtag on Twitter, um, CP Match, that sometimes they throw events where you can um, pitch your book and like exchange pages with people. And also, there's sometimes um, a uh, critique partner matchmaking. Like I know my agent sister Wendy Hurd does that. So if you go to her website, she has the option where she kind of helps people like matchmake a critique partner. Wow, thank you for all those great resources. Um, thank you guys all for coming in the audience and thank you to all of our authors. They will be signing copies of their books in the back. And thank you guys for sharing all that really great information. Thank you. <laughs>